Well, it's said that a picture is worth a thousand words, but for biologists, a picture might also be worth a thousand years. You see, scientists use pictures and diagrams to represent their understandings of science, but when we use those diagrams to teach in the classroom, those students don't always understand those diagrams as intended. So a common diagram that we biologists use all the time is called the tree of life. It represents this foundational concept in our field that all living things are related to one another. So take this kind of diagram, for example. This was drawn by Charles Darwin during his famous Voyage of the Beagle. And these tree diagrams come in many different shapes, sizes, colors, orientations, and they look wildly different, which makes it so difficult for students to understand these kind of diagrams. What I want you to understand is that when you look at some kind of teaching aspect, it's better not to focus on just one simple aspect, but on the larger diagram. Because for my master's thesis, I was extremely interested in how students understood these diagrams, but also how teachers taught these kind of diagrams to students. Because ultimately, we sell ourselves short when we attempt to only learn in one way, teach in only one way, and experience things in only one way. So what does this mean for students? Well, we know that incoming college students have a really hard time understanding what these diagrams represent because when they walk into the classroom, they bring with them a slew of misconceptions that act as barriers to their understanding. And a couple studies have actually tried to figure out what kind of approaches are best for teachers to use to help students overcome these barriers, but they're actually very limited because they only focus on one kind of teaching approach. So here I come to Texas State for my master's thesis to not focus on simply one approach, but I focus on four different ones. So I'm going to extremely briefly walk you through what these each were. So what I had first was no instruction. So students that didn't have any instruction about trees were considered my control group. Next, I had students that experienced some kind of implicit approach, which meant that they were exposed to these kind of diagrams in their textbooks and their lectures, but they were not explicitly taught by their teachers. Next, I have what I call the video method, where students interacted with an online video, where they point and clicked and learned about each of the different aspects of the trees, and also that there are so many different ways that these diagrams are represented. It's from the treeroom.org, and it's from the USC uh, joint session with some kind of museum that's also in Southern California, and it works really well. I highly recommend it. Um, next, I have this, what I call the manipulative model, uh, because students actually could take these different colored pipe cleaners and manipulate them with the hands-on tactile experience and bend them and shape them and twist them into any kind of orientation or style or shape that they wanted to. And last, I have what I call the extensive method, which is essentially a combination of the implicit, the video, and the manipulative model approach. And one of the findings from my thesis is that students that partook in this extensive approach actually had the highest learning outcomes statistically and significantly from any other individual outcome, which suggests to us that students learn better in diverse ways. But what does it mean for teachers? Well, we know that teachers were required to, that at least that taught in the extensive method, were required to teach this implicit video and manipulative model combination for you know, the next two weeks that they actually spent on teaching these diagrams. And it turns out that students actually, again, did have the highest learning outcomes, which again tells us that teachers should reach out or at least attempt to reach students in many different ways. And not only do I have a personal relationship with this uh, research because I actually did it, but I also have personal experience with this as a student myself in high school English, where we learned about rhetorical devices, and I hated it. It was <laughs> the worst thing because I had no idea why we even bothered using them in the first place. My teacher got so upset trying to figure out why is he not getting this. But she actually sat down with me and tried a couple different approaches. One, wrote memorization on flashcards, which didn't work. She tried sending me out of the classroom to find examples in different textbooks, knowing she knew that they were there, but I didn't know that didn't work as well. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, we actually tried picture association, which, well, not unfortunately, that actually did work because it worked in some aspect. So when we hear the word hyperbole, we think of it as an exaggeration. For me, I think of it as blowing things out of proportion. So every time I see the word hyperbole or see something exaggerated, I think of this bike tire air pump because that's what she showed me. And I think of someone pumping a bike tire so large that it just explodes because it's disproportionate or blowing things out of proportion. And that helped me a lot because she went above and beyond her call of duty as a teacher. And again, she used many different teaching approaches. And the best teachers use more than just one approach because they don't focus on the different aspects of learning. They want to focus on the bigger picture to get the best results for their students. So yeah, while the students actually learn better in diverse ways, it's also up to the teachers to reach their diverse students by teaching in diverse ways. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's great for the classroom, Austin. Well, I'm not an educator. I don't teach people. But I'm also not a student because I don't pay tuition anymore. But I would actually kind of argue that in one way or another, 
we're all students and we're all teachers. Because as students of life, we learn exceptionally well through experiencing many different things as possible. And learning from those experiences and from other people also helps us bridge the difference between us and the people that we might perceive to be different than us. For example, in the summer of 2016, I went on a study abroad trip with Texas State to Cambodia. And during our free time, myself, some of the instructors that are actually out in the audience with us today, and some of the students actually, during our free time, went to eat at a restaurant called The Bug Cafe. And it is exactly what, yeah, there it is. Um, <laughs> it's exactly what you might think it is. It is a restaurant that serves bugs incorporated into all their meals. So some of the things that I tried include, but are not limited to, a tarantula donut, which is a deep fried whole tarantula. I am not joking. I tried this uh, scorpion salad with dastardly water bugs. It was a very big mental block for me for this one. <laughs> I swear the scorpions were about this big. Um, I also tried spring rolls that were extra crunchy because they had a lot of ants in them. And what I learned that day from that experience was, while some people say fish are friends, not food, <laughs> bugs are not my friend, nor should they ever be considered food. <laughs> but essentially, I did find common ground with a man that owned the restaurant because he moved halfway across the world from Paris to Cambodia just simply to reach out and advocate that it's okay to include bugs in your diet, especially if you have dietary restrictions, non-GMO this or gluten-free that. So it's okay for some people that have those things to eat bugs because they are a renewable source of protein. And while he thinks they might taste great, I don't think so. But <laughs> in that experience, I was a student, so I was experiencing different things through eating bugs. But in that way, I saw him as a teacher. Because as teachers of life, we love to share our ideas and our experiences, very much like what I'm doing on the stage right now. In fact, some people might say that it's the responsibility of these life teachers to continuously expose people to as many different opportunities and different exper uh, not experiments, experiences as possible. Now, science brain got to switch. And so um, essentially what that is is we talked about that in the classroom by exposing different students to different methods, but we can also take that idea out of the classroom. Because as we continue to expose people to new experiences, we bridge the difference between what people know and what they don't know. And I love that because it's that aha moment. So yeah, you are all in a way students, and again, you are all in a way teachers. So while the master's thesis that I worked on actually helps students understand those tree diagrams that I spoke about earlier, I think there's also a larger application into a lot, much larger perspective about diverse experiences. So again, while those diagrams represent to us how all things are related to each other biologically and represent biodiversity, I think that learning from the world around us and from other people around us helps us better understand the world around us, especially bridging those differences between what people know and what they don't know, and from people who we might perceive to be different than us. And this is a picture that is very near and dear to my heart, because these are some of the Cambodian students that I helped teach how to teach biology in Cambodia, and that was a very long hike up to the very, very top of that mountain in that temple. Um, but essentially, yeah, I prefer showing people and sharing my experiences through pictures, because I love to take pictures. So while you might say, yes, a picture is indeed worth a thousand words, for me it's worth more than that. A picture is also worth a thousand experiences. Thank you.